This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello, and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for joining us and for following Working Like Dogs on Facebook and Instagram. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis, and my co-host is my amazing service dog, Lovey. And we're excited to be with you today to talk about our favorite subject, working dogs and working animals. And today, we're going to be welcoming Gloria Gilbert Stoga to the show, and she is the president and founder of one of our favorite organizations, Puppies Behind Bars. And she's going to talk with us today about the work that Puppies Behind Bars does to raise service dogs for wounded war veterans and first responders, as well as explosive detection canines for law enforcement. And she's also going to tell us about how these service dogs who are trained behind bars are providing comfort to healthcare heroes who are out there on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic. So we've got all kinds of great things to talk with her about today. So come right back after these quick messages as we welcome Gloria Gilbert Stoga to the show. She became overweight, stinky, several vertebrae fused together. Sophie was going to be euthanized. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. I remember Sophie starting the Dynavite. She has loved it. She is no longer stinky. She is full of life. Dynavite is nutrition. Get them on Dynavite right away while they're healthy. You won't believe how happy your dog will be. I get my Dynavite from D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. We're so excited to have Gloria Gilbert Stoga from Puppies Behind Bars with us today. Hello, Gloria, and welcome. Hi, thank you. Yeah, we're so excited that you could be with us, and gosh, we have so much to talk about. But as we get started, first of all, Gloria, I do want to ask you, how did you start Puppies Behind Bars? Tell us, how did that come into being? I read about a veterinarian in Florida who started the first prison, in his case, guide dog program, and I just thought it was brilliant. I thought it was absolutely ingenious. So... I thought about it for a while, and I tracked him down, met him, went to a couple of the prisons that he was operating in, and just decided I wanted to do something similar to that in the state of New York. And how did you get prison officials to let you do that? Because that was pretty bold. That was, what, back in, like, 1997? Yeah, we were the second or third in the country. I was really lucky. I knew Libby Pataki, who was then the first lady of New York State. Her husband, George Pataki, was the governor. So obviously, Libby, you know, had clout. Libby immediately understood that having inmates train dogs that would go out and help people would be educational, rehabilitative, and therapeutic for inmates. So she, from the get-go, got it. And the head of prisons for New York State at that time had a yellow laboratory retriever (laughs) who he used to bring to work with him. So I was really lucky because I didn't have to explain to him the therapy of dogs, and it was the exact breed that I wanted to put into his prison system. So it was just, it was serendipitous kind of from the get-go. Yeah. It sounds like all the stars were aligning, which is just, it's so wonderful when you have that happen and you have people who get it. Yeah. That's so great. So how many puppies did you start with? We started with five in um, New York State's only maximum security prison for women. 
Um, that was, as you said, in 1997. We are now in six prisons, and we have raised over 1,300 dogs. That's so awesome. Oh, I love it. Well, and so tell us, how does the program work now, um, Gloria? How do, how do inmates get to participate? It's voluntary. So they have to, which is really important, they have to want to do it. Um, everybody in prison has a job. So this is on top of their regular job, just like any of us. If we, you know, want to volunteer with anything, we, we still have all of our other responsibilities. So they have to apply. It's voluntary. They have to apply to their counselor in prison. There's certain criteria they have to meet. If they meet those criteria, then um, the Puppy Sam Bar staff and I interview everybody individually and decide whether or not we think that they would be a good candidate. Mm, I love it. And how long are the puppies with them? If they're explosive detection canines in training, they're with us for a year. If they're service dogs, then they live in prison for generally at least two years, sometimes as long as three years. It depends how quickly the dog matures. Wow. Well, that I can only imagine the impact that that has on people who are incarcerated to have that adorable, amazing, furry little puffball looking at them and, and them getting right. to have such an impact on the future of that dog and, and the impact that that dog is going to have. Yep. Wow. Well, so, and you mentioned, which one of the things I think is so interesting about your program is that you mentioned you you have these dogs trained for veterans and first responders, but then you do that explosive detection canine work for law enforcement. That's a little unusual for an agency that does more service dog training. So tell us how that happened. It was an outgrowth of September 11th. I live in New York. I'm a New Yorker. We're based in Manhattan, so we are a New York organization. And when our city and our country were attacked, um, we said, what can we do? And what we could do was help law enforcement find explosives before the explosives exploded. So we changed gears. We, we were raising guide dogs at that time for guide dog schools in the U.S. We added explosive detection canines because there was this need in the country all of a sudden. And then in 2006, we stopped raising guide dogs and we started raising service dogs exclusively for war veterans for the same premise. Our country's needs changed. You know, all of a sudden we were engaged in two wars and we had men and women coming home with physical and emotional wounds. So Puppy said, okay, what can we do? We What we can do is provide psychiatric service dogs um, and full-fledged service dogs to people who are coming home and, and need help. So we stopped raising guide dogs in 2006 and started raising service dogs exclusively, as I said, for war veterans. And then sadly for us, the third transition was in response to all the mass shootings in the country, we realized that people who are first on the scenes in schools, nightclubs, concerts, wherever these horrors were taking place, we realized that the psychological toll on police, firefighters, EMS who responded to mass shootings had to have been huge. And so we said, once again, our country has changed. What can we do? And that's when we added raising service dogs for first responders. So, you know, we're small and we're nimble. We will change as the needs around us change. I can't foresee where we will be a couple of years down the road because I don't know what our country is going to need, but we're there with dogs when there's a need for us. Yeah, you sure are. You've been so responsive to changes in society and needs that have arisen. So let me ask you, um, who are the handlers for the dogs that go out to respond um, for first responders? Are they volunteers with you or do you place those dogs with other organizations that actually go out and do the response? 
No, no, no. We um, have what we call our clients, and the clients are either a war veteran or a police officer or a firefighter, and they right. come to us, and they say, we want a service dog either for ourselves individually or we want a service dog for our department gotcha. for officer wellness. Mm-hmm. So we pair the dog directly with the handler. Gotcha. And we train the handler directly with the dog. So we do cool. 100% of the process. Okay, cool. So you train and then place the dogs, and yeah. then and then they would have those dogs available within their own agencies. Yes, or for their own personal needs. Right, right. That's so cool. I love it. And I just love how agile you are, that you can change. How was it to change and do the explosive detection canines? Did you have a lot of changes in your program? No, I w- not really, because... That was about building relationships with the law enforcement community. But the big change for us, which was huge, was when we shifted from guide dogs to service dogs. Because when we were doing guide dogs, we just did them for schools who then did the formal like end training and chose Mm -hmm. the client and paired the dog. All of a sudden, when we started providing service dogs to war veterans, we had to do 100% of everything ourselves. So that was a huge learning curve and a huge Mm -hmm. undertaking. I bet. Well, and are all your dogs trained in prison facilities or do you have other volunteers that train them? Nope. 100% of our dogs are raised in prison. I love it. Yeah, that's so great. That is so great. And how do you, because you've expanded, I think you said now you're in six facilities in New York and New Jersey. Yes. And how did you expand it? How did you get the other facilities to come on board? We expanded very slowly. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we knew what we were doing before we took on more. And how we got the other facilities to come on board was, they talked to the prisons we were in and the prison said, you know, this is phenomenal. It has a calming effect on everybody. It sets goals for the inmates in the program. It teaches them responsibility. They're learning marketable skills. So prisons, you know, started contacting us and saying, you know, will you come work in our facility? So expansion was slow, steady, but once we, we proved that we knew what we were doing and we were tough, um, we weren't just going to kind of show up and, oh, here's a puppy and then kind of leave, but we go in every single week and we teach one full day a week and we take dogs home to monitor them. Once once I think the prison saw the commitment on our end, they realized that it was a strong, viable program that they wanted to be part of. That's so wonderful. Yeah, they realized that you were the real deal and you were there for yeah, the long exactly. haul. Exactly. And not, and not yeah. 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 yeah, that's so great for everybody. Yeah, that's yeah. just so wonderful. So how is it that the program evolved? Tell us a little bit more about how you work with veterans. Veterans and first responders are very similar. Um, they contact us or they go right to our website. We have our application on our website. They fill it in. It's pretty lengthy. We will conduct an interview within two weeks. Our, our, we always say that we get back to anybody who applies to us within two weeks, so we're not keeping anybody waiting. We'll interview them, as I said, by phone. And based on that interview, if we think that they might be a good candidate for one of our dogs, we'll then start the process of interviewing healthcare providers, psychologists, psychiatrists, bosses if they're working, spouses, girlfriends, boyfriends, anybody that they suggest as references. Then we start doing our due diligence. And if everything checks out and we think that the dog is going to be safe with the recipient, And if we think that the recipient really needs and will use a service dog and isn't just trying to get a well-trained, purebred Labrador retriever, then we accept them for what is called team training. That's 14 days where we bring people in from around the country to upstate New York, and during that period, we teach them how to be a team with their dog. And the the wonderful part of that is of those 14 days, eight days are in prison. 
So the inmates are working directly with the recipients to teach them everything about the dogs. Um, and Puppy Sandbar staff literally like sits in the back of the classroom and we're just there to answer questions every once in a while. The inmates really are the ones who become the instructors. So for the inmates, it's full circle. You know, they've had these dogs since they're eight weeks of age. They love them dearly. They've gone through sickness and, you know, worry and limping and everything that one goes through when one has a doggy. And for the, for the inmates then to be able to say to somebody, here's the dog I've loved. I'm going to start crying, but here's the dog I've loved, I've nurtured, and I've trained for two years, and I want you to live with him for the rest of his life. It's it's just really extraordinary. Oh, Gloria, that is so fabulous. I was wondering if the people who are incarcerated, the trainers, if they actually had any interaction with the people that were receiving the dogs. So that's so beautiful that they get to have that interaction. And, and they need to because, as you said, they know these dogs so well and need to be sharing information with the veteran who's getting the dogs. So, oh. That's so exactly. wonderful. I can only imagine how much that means to them and the impact that it has on them for their stay while they're incarcerated and then for the rest of their lives. Right. And not every inmate meets the recipient because, as I said, we're in six prisons. So we, you know, we only do two team trainings a year. So we move from prison to prison. So all the inmates, you know, get to participate. So it's possible you're in a prison. Do you see what I'm saying? Where yes. You yeah. Dog, I gotcha. But, so, but all about, since we move around and we do two of these trainings a year, the inmates in our program get to work directly with the recipients of our dogs. And it yeah. is really extraordinary. Oh, that is. Oh, I love that model. That is so wonderful. Well, we are going to take just a really super quick break because we want to come back and keep visiting with Gloria. We want her to tell us when we come back from the break about the work that they're doing to comfort our healthcare heroes on the front lines of the pandemic that we're all experiencing right now. So we're going to hear some important messages because we love our sponsors, but come right back after these quick messages. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com <laughs> Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio, and we're visiting today with president and founder of Puppies Behind Bars, Gloria Gilbert Stoga. And Gloria, you were sharing so many wonderful things with us before the break, but I do want to ask you now to please tell us what are you guys doing to provide comfort to our healthcare heroes right now who are on the front lines of this unbelievable pandemic that we found ourselves in? Well, for us, that has ended luckily because most of the nurses have left New York City. So, you know, obviously everybody's thrilled if if nurses can go home because our numbers aren't as bad as they were. But yes. we did this in April and May. Um, I got a call from a Sergeant Richard Massey of the New York National Guard asking if we could bring service dogs in to help with his young soldiers who were overseeing the Javits Center, which was set up as a temporary hospital. And his soldiers were stationed at the Marriott in Times Square, and New York is 
like other cities, totally closed down. So they'd be working 12 hours at the Javits Center and then come back to this hotel and there was nothing to do. There was nothing to do outside. And, you know, they were just kind of sequestering in their rooms along with their thoughts. And in that same hotel were, I think, 800 nurses. So I, as soon as the call came in, I knew that the answer was yes. Of course we will help. We're, as I said, we're New York City based. This is our hometown. The soldiers and the nurses are here to help us. Of course we will do what we can to help them. So within seven days of getting that call, our first dogs were on the scene. And we went to, we ended up going to a total of two hotels, eight shifts a week for two hours a time. And we would bring our dogs, and the dogs were there. Now I am going to start crying because even though we stopped, it's just such a fresh memory. They were there to meet the nurses when the nurses went on their shifts, or more importantly, they were there to meet the nurses when the nurses unloaded from the buses, coming home from the Javits and the hospitals back to the hotel. And the nurses were shell-shocked. There was just so much pain and exhaustion and fear in their eyes. It was just, it was extraordinary. And they'd come from all over the United States. They were stuck in this hotel in a city they didn't know, dealing with death every Mm. single day. So what we found was two things. One The nurses decontaminated, but then as soon as they got to the hotel, they had to go to their rooms and decontaminate again. And we found that they would go to their rooms and they wouldn't come out. So we used the dogs as a lure. The dogs are going to be here from, I forget, you know, the hours. I guess we were there. Our morning shift was 8.30 to 10.30. So the dogs are going to be here from 8.30 to 10.30, you know, shower, change your clothes, decontaminate, and come down and play with the dog. Right. Hurry. Yes. Hurry. (laughs) Um, And then after about five weeks of doing this, we found that the nurses were coming down, they were playing with the dogs, they were petting the dogs, but then they were going up to their rooms and they were crying. Mm. So we switched. We said, cry into the dog, cry Mm. into his fur, it's Mm. okay. And the dogs became Mm. the conduit for the frustration, the fear, the exhaustion. So the dog's role was just absolutely vital in helping people who'd come from across the country to help us in New York. But you've got me crying, Gloria. Oh, that's so sorry. Oh, no, (laughs) but it's what a gift. What a gift for for everybody and for for your agency to be able to do something. Because so many of us, you know, the first responders and the nurses and all of the people on the front lines, they're doing so much. And I know I felt like I couldn't do enough. So how wonderful that your dogs were able to do that. And I am sure that they had tremendous impact on everybody that they touch because they are so genuine and so present and just so non-judgmental. I mean, it's like the perfect being to have an experience with when you're in such an unbelievable and tragic experience that they were living every day. Exactly. I love it. That's so awesome. Well, I do want to ask you, how has the coronavirus impacted the way that you're working now in these prison facilities? We've still been going every single week, Puppies and Bar staff. We've been taking two dogs into our homes for a week to monitor them and then going back and exchanging them for two more dogs. So we're seeing the inmates each week. We're seeing the dogs each week, but we can't teach. But we're about to start teaching via video conference until the prisons reopen, and hopefully that is soon. Yeah, great. I know that that they're so vulnerable to this. So I'm so glad that you guys have found out a way to to make that work so that they're the the people who are incarcerated are still getting to to work with the dogs and have that experience. That's great. Yeah, Yeah, that's it. And boy, you guys are the definition of flexibility and adaptation. I just love that. We are. Yeah. We're not bureaucratic. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Well, can you tell us about one inmate or one dog that you've worked with over the years, Gloria, that inspired you? 
that sticks out in your mind the most? Oh, there have been hundreds. Like, <laughs> I mean, literally, um, just hundreds. Uh, you know, people who are quiet and in class they start speaking up. They start asking questions, answering questions. They find out that they have a voice. They find out that they're actually smart. Um, they may not be smart in terms of book learning, but they find out they have a real gift for working with dogs and loving dogs. We've seen that time and time and time again where people really become leaders in an environment where leadership isn't, you know, isn't that frequent? Um, and in terms of the dogs, you know, they're all pure. They're all just goodness. You know, mm-hmm. there's no, obviously I have my favorites. Everybody does because each dog has his or her own personality. But in terms of is there a standout, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of standouts because they're all just, they're so trusting of humans. They're so willing to please. They're just so happy. I think that's a hallmark of our dogs. From the time they're born, they're around humans who love them. They're around humans who take care of them. They're around humans who teach them that a human being is a good, caring thing. And our dogs, I think, have a certain sense about them because 24-7, they're never not with a human. I know that's not good English. And they're also because they're raised in prison and they're raised by people who need them. So our dogs are different from pets. There's nothing wrong with a pet dog, but our dogs are different from pets because they just have this innate sense, somebody needs me and I'm going to give. And I have seen that time and time and time and time again. And for our dogs that don't make it as working dogs and are adopted out as pets, everybody tells me this. Everybody says, I've had dogs my whole life. I've had dogs for 30 years. I've had dogs for 50 years. I've never had a dog with this kind of relationship. It's just, it is extraordinary that they just love and trust people and want to help as much as they do. Yeah. It's hard to even articulate it, you know, of really yeah. how genuine they are. These yeah. dogs that have been through these types of training programs and bred for this kind of work. It's yeah. just, it really is hard if you haven't been exposed to it, how to really describe it and articulate it. I'm still blown away by my service dog every day and I've had one for over 25 years but I am still at at how much they really care and are so present and like you said just so loving and I just adore that in a prison facility where so many of the people who are there have not had that kind of experience of true love and genuineness and and that you know really going to stick by you and and really love you for who you are no matter who you are they think you're the greatest in the world so that's just that's exactly. such genius to put those two together it really is gloria it really Thank really you. is thanks Yeah, so I have to ask you then, what's the biggest life lesson that you've learned from your work? Um, um, Not to be, well, I can't say not to be judgmental because I think I still am, even though I try not to be. Working with the different populations I work with has so broadened my perspectives, has so opened my eyes to people, lifestyles, challenges, that I knew nothing about. And I am convinced and I know that I am a fuller person by having gotten as deeply engaged as I have in communities where they weren't part of my life beforehand. And it's just, it's really broadened my horizons and it's really, it's been enriching for me to have my life's work be with people that I otherwise wouldn't have met yeah yeah it's so true I mean it it does it 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 opens you up to so many other experiences and 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and it is, it's hard to be, it does help you with that judgment when you can see the dogs being so non-judgmental and the positive response from that. It's such a life lesson for me, at least. It's like, wow, that really works when you're not, <laughs> when you're honest and, and open and trusting. And, you know, it's just, it's so beautiful to see that and uh, to witness it. But then for people who haven't had that in their life and to get it unconditionally from that canine and then for that canine to go on and have such a positive impact as a result of their work that they've done that they've put into that dog I really do I think it's genius and I can't wait to hear more about how your program grows and what you guys are doing next because boy you've got a you've got all kinds of wonderful things going on over at Puppies Behind Bars Gloria yep well thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak about them Yeah, well, tell us how our listeners can get more information about Puppies Behind Bars and how they can follow you on social media. Yeah, um, our website's puppiesbehindbars.com. We're on, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, they should come to our website um, or to any of the social media accounts. We've got great videos, great pictures. Yeah, I mean, that's how to get in touch and that's how to follow us. Okay, wonderful. Well, and we'll be sure and post that on our show and so that people can find you guys because you're just doing such great work and there's such beautiful, beautiful images of all of your dogs. So thank you so much for being with us, Gloria. And we hope you'll come back and visit with us again because I can only imagine what future adventures that you and your dogs are going to have. (laughs) Well, thank you for the invitation. I'd love to take you up on it. And thank you, our listeners, for being with us. We love for you to join us, and we love to hear from you. So let's keep staying connected. And you know that you can email me at marcie, M-A-R-C-I-E, at PetLifeRadio.com. And you know that you can follow us at Working Like Dogs on Facebook and Instagram. And we just love seeing your photos and hearing about the incredible work that you're doing with your working dogs every day. So thanks so much for being with us and take good care. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.